I greet you in Jesus' precious name. It's just so good to be with you again on this program. It's a beautiful summer's day. And I've got a, a serious message for you today, my dear friend. I, I, I really believe in my heart that some of you are saying, Lord, what's happening to my life? My prayers are not being answered. Things seem to be going wrong. Have you abandoned me? I haven't heard from you for a while. Are you feeling a bit like that? You know, sometimes I heard a person say once, it's just as well God doesn't answer all our prayers the way we want. Because if He did, we'd be in a terrible mess. And some of you are smiling at me already while you've got that cup of coffee and that cup of tea. Some of you are going to go into business and for some reason the door closed. Well, you know why it closed now, because God closed the door. And if you look back and if you'd gone into that business, you would have gone bankrupt. Isn't that right? That's right. And that relationship, you really thought that man loved you, didn't you? Only to find out that he's had a numerous affairs since then. And you thank God that the relationship ended when it did. So we don't always know why things happen. But one thing we do know, our God is a good God. See, he's so good that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for sinners like you and me. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, that's you and I, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What we're speaking about today is unconditional surrender. We've got to be like that old farmer, Job, who said, Even though He slay me, yet will I still trust Him. Folks, that's found in Job chapter 13, and verse 15, I want to ask you a question. Can you honestly say that? Can you say, Angus, I know him so well that even though I die, I will still not turn my back on God. You know that Job's own wife, when she saw what Job was going through, he was the most prosperous farmer in the Middle East. And he lost everything. Remember when the devil came and said, the only reason that Job serves you is because he's prospering and you're blessing him. And the Lord said, don't touch his life, but you can test him if you want. And you'll see he will not betray me. And remember what happened. He lost his farm. He lost his animals. He lost his family. He lost his home. He got sick. He was full of boils from the top of his head to the tip of his toes. He was sitting in the ash heap in the middle of town, the laughing stock of the town. And his own wife said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? And he said, even though he slay me. Yet will I still trust Him. My dear friend, in these last days in which we are living, God is not interested in fair-weather Christians. He's not interested in men and women who say, I'll serve you, Lord, as long as you answer my prayers. If you don't answer my prayers, I'm not serving you anymore. Those days are over. We are in a war like never before. I'm not giving the devil any glory. We don't even talk about him on this program. But we need to understand one thing. At the moment, the devil is hell-bent on sending as many people as he can to hell. That's an absolute fact. Remember, he can't hurt you physically, but what he can do, he can tell you lies. The Bible says he's the father of all lies. He's the deceiver of the brethren. You've got to concentrate on the Word of God and what God says about you in these days. Now, sometimes, you and I, maybe we stray off the path, and He will capture our attention at any cost. I'll say that again. He will capture our attention. God wants you for Himself. Okay? Let me give you an example. They tell me in the outback of Australia. Now, I, I, I spent time in Australia. The Australians taught me how to ride horses. They really did. They were amazing stockmen. Right in the middle of the outback, there are huge properties. They call them properties, not farms or ranches. And they might go for 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Now for a farmer, one farmer on horseback, or even if he's got a, 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 a bike, off-road bike, for him to round up his cattle, to be able to doctor them, to be able to vaccinate them, wean the calves, whatever, is virtually impossible. So what they do is they turn off the water. That's right. And within two days, all the cows are standing in the front gate. They're looking for water. 
Sometimes God does that. Sometimes He withdraws the rain for a season because He wants to catch the attention of His people. But remember, every drought ends up with rain. I know the rain's coming. I have no doubt about it. But what God is requiring from you and me, my dear friend, is our attention. He wants us to listen to Him. Everywhere I go these last couple of weeks, all people are talking about is the weather and about God. That's right. Even the unbeliever, the backslider, the lukewarm Christian. Where is God? When's the rain coming? Angus, you tell us God's the weatherman. If God's the weatherman, why is He not sending the rain? You see, good question. <laughs> and then I have to tell them the truth. Well, maybe God wants to catch your attention. Maybe God wants to speak to you and I. And often, He will turn off the water in order to get our attention. Or maybe something else in your own life. I know I've been through some big experiences, personal tragedies, in my family, in the farm, economic. And I want to tell you something right now from the bottom of my heart, my dear friend. I don't believe that God will allow a little boy to run across the road so that a drunken driver can knock, o knock him over and kill him to catch the attention of the drunken driver. No, I don't believe he does that. Not the Jesus I serve. He says he will not even break a, a bent reed or extinguish a smoldering flax. But he will get our attention. I want to read a scripture to you, and it's found in the book of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, and from verse 1 through to 9. I'm going to read it to you in the New King James Version. It's a parable that Jesus told. I want you to listen carefully. And then he began to speak to them in parables, and he said, A man planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge around it. He dug a place for the wine vat to be built, and a tower and he leased it to the vine dressers, and he went away into a far country. Verse 2. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him, and they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Verse 4. Again, he sent to them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and they sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, now listen to this, his beloved son, okay, his only son, he also sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said amongst themselves, this is the heir, this is the young man that's going to inherit this farm. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Verse 8, they took him and they killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will destroy the vine dressers and he will give the vineyard to others. I stop there. This is the word of the Lord. Folks, I know it's a heavy message, but Jesus told the story, not me. Jesus sometimes sends us a warning. And then he sends us another warning. And then he sends us another warning. And if you don't listen, then because he loves you, not because he hates you, then he has to take drastic measures. He might have to turn off the water. That's right. He might have to do something with your business if it becomes your God. Maybe it's your sport. I don't know what it is. And he might just say, that's enough now. Now, folks, you say to me, Angus, is that possible? You know, I just read just before this, this uh, program, in Isaiah chapter 57, 
and verse 16, the Lord says, I will not contend with you forever. I looked up the dictionary to find out what the word contend means, the Oxford Dictionary. Contend means I will not strive with you forever. Some of us are not listening. Sir, if you don't change your ways, you'll probably lose your wife. I'm telling you, it's the word of the Lord. If you don't treat her with love and respect, and you don't come home at night, you might just come home one day and she's gone. Oh, she'll never leave me, uh, Uncle Angus. My dear friend, I'm warning you. Okay? God will not tolerate a man who beats his wife. Sometimes they write to me and they say, Uncle Angus, my husband is beating me and my, my children are, and I'm afraid. What should I do? Because the Bible says that, uh, you know, we pray to pray until death do us part. You know what I say to her? Pack your bags and leave immediately. Don't put your children and your life at risk because your husband is not hearing from God. God will not contend with you and me forever. You know the truth because the truth will set you free. Yet you choose to walk in rebellion with God. You know what I'm afraid of in these last days? There's no more fear of God. There's no more reverence for God. Job chapter 28 and verse 28 says, The fear of God, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. You and I need to start to respect God. We need to start to treat Him with reverence. If you, if you are not looking after your workers, and you are paying them a mere pittance for a day's work, God will not tolerate that. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. If you are a lazy man, and when your, your, your boss or your employer goes away, just like in the book, just the story I've just read, and you sit down and you do nothing, do not be surprised if you do not lose your job. The Lord has got no time for lazy people. Okay, I really mean that. We need to understand that God will catch our attention at any cost. Why? Because He loves you. You see, the story Jesus was telling was actually about Himself. I believe that. God, the Father, has only got one Son, and His name's Jesus. Right? He sent the prophets. What did they do to the prophets? They stoned them. They killed them. They abused them. And then eventually... Our Heavenly Father says, I will send my only begotten Son. Surely they will listen to Him. And what did we do? We crucified Him on the cross. Who crucified Him? Our sin crucified Jesus. Not the Romans, not the Jews, not... No, our sin. Every time you willfully sin against God, you put His Son on the cross. He says, I will not contend with you forever. So this word... Might be a, a hard word for you, but I believe it's a blessing. It's a warning from God. He is warning you to get your life right. Your children, some of them don't want to speak to you. Why? Because every time they try to address you, you shout them down. You won't listen to them. You've got your own game plan. Dad, can you just come and watch me play sport? No, I'm too busy. I'm doing my own thing. Dad, can I have a chat to you? No, I'm too busy. You know that story I told you about that... Uh, Minister, it's a true story. He used to have a counseling sessions every Thursday. Thursday afternoon, his secretary says, your next appointment's here, sir. He said, bring her in. And in came a 16-year-old girl, a beautiful girl, her eyes filled with tears. He looked up, it was his own daughter. The daughter of the minister. He got so angry, he said, is this some kind of a joke? And then she started crying. She said, no, Dad, I don't know how to get your attention. I'm trying to speak to you, so I've made an appointment. Folks, that is bad news. We need to be there for our children. We need to be there for our wives. We need to be there for our people, whoever they may be. Because God says, I will get your attention. I'll give you a practical example of what the Lord means about capturing our attention. He wants you to be saved at all costs. That's right. He doesn't want you to go to hell. Some preachers don't even preach about hell anymore. There is a place called hell. In fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did, did about heaven. 
And that's why some people are just living riotously and immorally because they don't actually believe that uh, sinners are going to hell. This program is called Grassroots. We are telling you the truth in love because we love you, not for any other reason. By the way, I'm speaking to myself as well. All roads do not lead to heaven. Okay? John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one's going to heaven but by me. It's very serious. That's why he died for your sins and for my sins. We can't in any way soft soap it. I love speaking to young people. You know why I love speaking to young people, my dear friend? Because young people want the truth. They don't want a soft soap story. You know, I heard a terrible, terrible example of what hell must be like. A minister said he had a dream. And, and he dreamt that he went down to hell. And he said it was like mud, liquid mud. And people were drowning in the mud. And he saw one man wading through the mud. And he was picking up the heads of people that had died. That's right. And in the dream, I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for the preacher that put me in this place. Okay. Remember when I was called to preach the gospel, the Lord said to me very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verses 17 through to 19, son of man. I've made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. That's you and me. Therefore, when I say to the wicked man, thou shalt surely perish, and you do not give him warning to turn from his wicked ways, he will die in his sin. But his blood shall I require at your hands. My dear friend, I love you too much. I don't want your blood on my hands. But if you warn the wicked man to turn from his wicked ways, and he heareth not, he will die in his sin, but you have redeemed your soul. Simple as that. Go and look it up. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. That is a scripture I was called to preach the gospel with. I have an obligation to God and to you to tell you the truth. God wants your attention, and He will capture it, in any way he wants to, but he will get your attention. Then you still have to make a decision. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, and I'm reading from verse, uh, verse 9, just one verse. And the Lord Jesus says, And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into hell fire. Jesus said that. I can't stress it more. And why am I talking like this? Because I'm seeing too many compromised Christians walking around. My dear friend, you say, Angus, I'm still a young man. I've still got lots of years to sow my wild oats and then I'll come to Jesus. Don't do that. I only have one regret in my life, and that is that it took me 32 years to wake up. I was 32 years old when I gave my life to Christ. Don't do that, because you know something? God might take you home before then. You know the story about the rich farmer? Jesus told that story too, another parable. There was a rich farmer. He plowed all his lands up, beautiful crops of maize, of wheat, barley. He had a bumper crop waiting for him. So he said to himself, I'll build another barn because I don't have enough space to get all my crops in. And then I'll sit down, I'll relax, and I'll eat, drink, and be merry. And you know what the Lord said? He said, foolish man, don't you realize tonight I require your soul? So tonight is judgment day. Don't think that we're going to be here forever. We're not going to. So we need to live life abundantly. Jesus said, I came to give you life abundantly. Not to, not to spoil anything. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. But abundant life is to live in the fullness of what God's given you. And when you do that, you'll start to live. Some of you are living in hell at the moment. 
because you're caught up with drug addiction, alcoholism, pornography, I don't know what else. It's already started. Now, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that the Lord will catch your attention. You might not even like me for this program, and folks, it's not about that. I love you too much for that. I don't care if you don't like me. I need to tell you the truth for your sake, not for my sake, and ultimately for God's sake, because God loves you so much that He allowed His only begotten Son to die a cruel death on the cross of Calvary so that you could have eternal life. So we're going to pray. And we're going to repent and we're going to say sorry to the Lord. And then we're going to put things right. And maybe for some of you after this program, turn the TV off, sit down with a cup of tea and have a chat to your wife. Have a chat to your husband and just say sorry. I'm sorry for the way in which I've been neglecting you. Sorry for the way in which I've been treating you. Maybe some of you need to just SMS that woman you're having an affair with and say from tonight it's over. Maybe some of you need to go to that man that you're in partnership with and you know he's not even a Christian and say, listen, we can't carry on. Because I have to tithe and I have to serve Jesus. And the Lord will honor you. And He'll give you an abundant life. So would you like to bow your heads and pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you will catch our attention. And you'll do it at any cost. Maybe for some of us already, it's been a tremendous cost. But Lord, I pray that we will learn from our mistakes. Lord Jesus, that we'll realize that you're not against us, you're for us. You came to give us life abundantly. You said that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we have to do it your way. So Lord, I pray for my friends that are listening and watching this program right now. That Lord, this will be a, des a deciding moment in their lives. I pray Lord that they will take note from this message that they will change their ways and that they'll turn back to you and then lord you will restore their lives not them you as they surrender their lives to you i ask this in jesus name amen well there we have it you've prayed that prayer with me now what do i have to do angus well you have to turn the other way that's what repentance means and walk the opposite direction you need to say from today onwards, I'm not listening to the lies of the devil anymore. I'm not listening to the pressure and the peer pressure of this world. I'm now going to do whatever Jesus says in this book. And then I know I'm going to have a new beginning. I'm going to have an abundant life and I will be ready when he calls me home. Until next time, goodbye.